Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up the past 24 or so hours. A few days ago, AMD uploaded a video on their official YouTube channel, which detailed why you should buy an AMD Ryzen Pro CPU. Amy covered the initial controversy that this video sparked because at around 1 minute 30 seconds into the video, an image was shown of blazing fast clock frequencies. And indeed, you could see a gauge that was displayed on screen with 5 GHz. Now, there were two ways to read the gauge, and how you read it really was down to you. The first way is that the gauge was running at 5 GHz, which would imply, of course, that that was the speed that AMD uh, Ryzen 3000 series CPUs, or at least the professional ones, could hit. The other way to look at it was no 5 GHz was the maximum frequency of the gauge, and, well, the clocks were not being attained by that on the CPU. However, if you look how close the needle to, or, or, um, on the gauge was to like the end, it still looked like it was hitting like 4.7, 4.8 GHz, which is still much higher than what Zen 2 is capable of achieving. Instead, depending on A, your cooling solution, B, the luck of the draw in with the silicon lottery, and also C, uh, which... Uh, version of a Gisu you're using, plus a few other uh, variables as well, you may have clock frequencies of the low 4 gigahertz, uh, maybe 4.3 gigahertz range, and if you've got high water, uh, high end water cooling setup, then obviously you may be able to go a little bit higher, particularly if you're, you know, doing things like uh, just a quick run for just benchmarking, but it may not be stable. It will be, however, quite interesting to see what the 3950X is capable of, as potentially they may do some uh, binning for that uh, silicon, but who knows, because we don't have the CPUs to test right now. Well, there has been an update to this, and AMD have actually removed that image, or at least edited it, for their re-upload. The original video has since been nuked from their YouTube channel, you can no longer view it, and instead a new image has popped up with blazing fast clock speed, and the gauge is now maxed in the, well... Well, you don't actually know what it's maxed at, because it just says gigahertz. So what gigahertz? Like 1 gigahertz, 2 gigahertz, all of the gigahertz in the whole world? Uh, yeah, it's kind of funny as an edit, because already people are making memes, memes of it. It's like, how many, how many uh, gigahertz does your processor run at? AMD responds, yes. And I, I know that sounds like I'm kind of being mean to the company, but the thing is, clock speeds as an architecture only matter to that architecture. It's like, well, you can get a Pentium 4 and run it, let's say, at 4 gigahertz, but you can run that with hyper-threading at 4 gigahertz, and it's still going to get beaten with a stick by, like, an i9-9900K. Heck, you could even run, like, a 4770K or even a 2600K or 2500K with one core uh, and two threads. Well, okay, you can't do it with uh, 2500K because it doesn't have hyper-threading, but you know what I mean. So, clock frequency is only relative to that architecture, so AMD don't really need to push the clock frequency in that regard, because it doesn't actually matter outside of that CPU, it's, it's marketing, of course. Uh, so, I think this was a really poor decision with blazing fast clock speeds, and they're already getting quite a lot of stick online. We all know about the Agisa stuff, where uh, the initial Agisa updates were considered, uh, sorry, initial Agisa versions uh, basically were very uh, aggressive with the clock frequencies that they put out, and Asus actually had a representative that said, well, that's one of the reasons that AMD have uh, changed the Agisa so it's not quite so aggressive for boosting, because they were concerned about the longevity of the CPUs. Uh, in my opinion as well, Robert Halleck did not help uh, things too much with uh, his video online, where he discussed uh, how Precision Boost worked, in his video, which was titled Updates to Precision Boost Overdrive for AMD Ryzen 3000 series, he had a theoretical processor, admittedly, but Precision Boost running at 4.55, and then with the Precision Boost Overdrive and, you know, in theoretical maximum, he said it could reach 200 megahertz. in addition to that if your system has the headroom. So he used the example of 4.75 gigahertz, and we know that the CPUs are just not doing that in reality. 
And you know what? That's fine because Ryzen 3000 is kicking all types of butt. It's an incredibly impressive processor. And the fact that you could have bought a B350 motherboard on launch back in 2017 and put one of these CPUs in, let's say, for example, 3600X or 3600, and have an incredibly decent gaming performance it's amazing. So AMD don't really need to do this, and I, I really hope that they kind of change their tune on the marketing department, um, because I, I don't think it's a particularly good look. But now on to a couple of pieces of positive AMD news, the first of which is a Linux driver patch for Renault. So Renault obviously is an upcoming next generation APU from the company, and clock frequency with AMD CPUs is critical. You could say it's crucial, ha <laughs> ha, oh god. Um, and when obviously you're dealing with an APU, it's even more important because it, well, features a GPU, and clearly GPUs and memory bandwidth are kind of like best buddies skipping down the street together. So there is an update on the uh, driver patches which have been sent out for Linux. This was actually on the 28th. And it seems to indicate that Renault will actually support low-power DDR4 memory up to 4266 megahertz. So that's a massive improvement with the Ryzen 3000 series, although obviously slightly different. Uh, that has a recommended clock frequency of 3200 megahertz DDR4, which is obviously a different standard to low-power DDR4. And their Picasso uh, processors have an officially supported speed of 2400 megahertz. Clearly, all of that, official, unofficial, is, you know, you, you can certainly uh, go higher than that, like Ryzen 3000, for example, you can go 3600, 3700, or whatever. Ice Lake, uh, that hits up to 3733 megahertz uh, for low-power DDR4, and for traditional DDR4, well, desktop DDR4, it is... 3200 megahertz so we're definitely seeing a major improvement to the integrated memory controller we also see thanks to forenix.com another linux patch in relation to renault and this is uh, that the uh, apu will likely support dcn 2.1 that is display core next and what's really interesting about that is because raven ridge uses dcn1 and uh, Narve uses DCN2, so it's going to be really interesting to see why, because all of the rumours and the leaks so far is that Renault will use Vega. So Vega obviously has an older generation display engine rather than uh, display, uh, sorry, DCN2. And the final piece of AMD news is that the PS4 as well as the Xbox One development actually has made AMD much better with security, believe it or not. And according to them, the work that they put into both the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 systems, and making them as unhackable as possible, he says, not, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not saying anything, and certainly don't Google PS4 and uh, backups, because that's not going to return you any results at all. That's the, yeah. Anywho, um, so apparently this has actually been beneficial for AMD with Epic. And in turn, that, ironically enough, has also ha helped Google and the cloud gaming solutions that it offers. And uh, Forrest Norod, in an interview with CRN, said, and I quote, previous generations of a game console could be hacked. And so you could probably go down to any number of places within a 10-mile radius and buy a 4 terabyte hard drive with every PlayStation 3 game ever written onto that hard drive. He also goes on to say that the performance of games is obviously critical. I was like, okay, you can run a container or vo virtual machine on this box and you don't have to trust the person that physically controls the box. That's cool, says Forrest. We're putting that into our server roadmap. So that's where it came from. It has to be highly performant because you can't take a performance penalty playing games and it has to be completely secure because the entire business model of that industry relies on licenses for selling the software. 
Originally with secure memory encryption and also secure encrypted virtualization SME and SEV respectively, there was only 15 keys available but with the second generation of EPIC processors, aka ROM, that's been expanded so now we have up to 509 keys available which means that you can run an absolute ridiculous number of virtual machines securely. And the final piece of news for today that we'd like to cover, because it's one of the cooler pieces, is researchers have built a carbon nanotube processor. And it's not exactly a powerhouse. It has just enough performance to power the simple programming uh, phrase, hello world. And yes, carbon nanotubes have been heralded as a wonder material for some time now, but it's been extremely difficult to actually create anything that uh, is actually capable of running anything. This particular processor is absolutely minuscule in terms of the number of transistors that it has. It has just 14,000, which does sound a lot, but remember modern day GPUs as well as CPUs have billions sometimes of transistors which are used in them, although of course they are using silicon. So one of the issues that have plagued uh, the creation of carbon nanotube processors is the actual distribution of the material itself, or rather the distribution of the nanotubes uh, during the fabrication. So basically they literally squeeze together and then they form non-operational transistors. So according to the team, they've largely managed to solve those issues and one of the researchers involved, Max Schukler, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, has said that these processors could operate on one third of the energy and up to three times faster than the conventional silicon CPUs that we're using now, but obviously this is not going to happen overnight, it's going to take some time. They've managed to create a processor, which, as I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, contains just 14,000 transistors, and it is just a 16-bit CPU. And it is based on the RISC-V instruction set. It's an open standard. Uh, so the reason behind that, of course, is other uh, CPU standards, such as, let's say, x86, have hefty licensing fees or very difficult, difficult to procure the licensing fees. So with RISC-V, it's an open standard, so they don't need to worry about anything like that. Uh, and the CPU was just capable of spitting out the phrase, Hello world, which is not incredibly impressive in terms of performance but what it does show is that they are starting to move towards this and quite frankly moving towards different materials is going to be of critical importance of course as computers continue to evolve but with things like 3d stacking and triplets it is continuing the tradition on pushing Moore's law at least in terms of the spirit I suppose of the law but eventually moving to different materials is going to be of critical importance I think that's just about it for today's video, so hopefully you've enjoyed it. If you did, then feel free to subscribe to the channel for much more content, and also drop a like on the video because both actions help us out a lot, of course, in the land of YouTube. And I hope you have an amazing day. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.